we're taking the weeks leading up to Christmas to think about Jesus. I'm just asking God to give us a holy fascination for who he is and all that he's done for us. <laughs> I was just talking to the Holy Spirit while I was watching that, just saying, Holy Spirit, we're talking about our favorite man. <laughs> oh, uh, can, can I just make that a prayer? Lord, would you just touch us right now with a holy fascination of this glorious man who sits on the throne of heaven Open the eyes of our understanding. Give me utterance today to speak your words. In Jesus' name. Next time you hear the Christmas carol, uh, hark the herald angels sing. Just stop and think about the last two verses. Listen to these lyrics. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come. Offspring of the favored one. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings. Risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Man, that is a piece of truth. That, is a, that song is loaded. Today, I wanna go back to where we started last weekend and talk about Jesus' supremacy over everything. The New Testament book of Hebrews was written to a group of first century Jewish believers who were under heavy duty persecution because they believed that Jesus rose from the dead as the God-man and rightful ruler of the earth. And so the, not only are the Romans persecuting them, their fellow Jews are persecuting them. And, and so the focus of this book is on Christ's superiority. He's, he's, he, the intent is to reignite their faith and their total reliance on him for everything. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things which means God is the Father, has given his son Jesus the earth and everything in it for his inheritance. And we just kind of flesh that out. Jesus is the heir of all. I mean, that is such a massive idea. We spent the whole weekend looking at it. Didn't even scratch the surface. It's the number one aspect of Jesus' supremacy. But there are a total of seven things listed here. So I wanna just kind of sit around the campfire with you this morning and and just gaze into this mystery. And, and again, we're trusting the Holy Spirit to be our teacher because he's the one who knows this stuff. He knows all the secrets and the wisdom uh, about this man. So it's in his light, we see light, and God, we're trusting you to shine light on this. Look at verse two. Through him, Jesus, he, uh, uh, through whom, we're talking about Jesus, also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. I'll go back to that, uh, back up the verse there. Second thing we're told here is that Jesus is the creator of the worlds. And, and it's interesting that the word is plural because this is more than just the physical world. He's talking about the spiritual world as well of angels and demons and all their authority structure. And the word literally means the ages. So it, it, it also includes all the time frames in which God's story and purpose is unfolding. He's saying Jesus is the architect of it all. He created everything and he determines uh, what's gonna happen with what he's created. And the reason he's making the distinction uh, of the heir being the creator was to debunk the heresy that was going around saying, yeah, Jesus is an only teacher, you know, he's a prophet, but he's not God. He said, by virtue of Jesus being creator, he has to be God because only God can create. Colossians 1.16, the apostle Paul echoes it by saying, by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Everything exists 
for Christ to display his greatness. Nothing in the entire universe, visible or invisible, exists for its own sake. Think about that. Nothing you see is the result of random chance. It was all created by an intelligent designer who, like any true artist, is revealing himself through his art. Think about it this way. There was, before there was us, there was him. <laughs> and he made the world to express the greatness and the beauty of who he is. The wonders of creation are all a revelation of this God who loves beauty. The Bible says he created it with us in mind. It was all uh, for the, all the forethought he put into this was for us. No, no wonder. You know, I love to ski and hike beautiful mountains like you're seeing. Oh man, let's go. <laughs> I mean, no wonder I love sunsets and I love, you know, to snorkel and scuba dive the crystal clear waters of the Caribbean. Oh my goodness. That's unbelievable, isn't it? That's what you see under those those waters, it's just un unreal. I mean, it, it, it's why we're exhilarated when we, we, that's, by the way, that's St. John, I think. I'm pretty sure in the Caribbean. Oh, look at that. I've snorkeled around that little thing. <laughs> I mean, no, no one would exhilarated when we watch a whale breach, you know, and people go to vacations just to see whales, or when we, Watch a massive thunderstorm with, look at that, wow, with all kinds of lightning. I mean, it's just, there's, there's an exhilaration in that. And the reason the natural world moves us the way it does is because we were created in his image. And that's what moved him. That's what he likes. That's why we like it. We're his kids. I've been watching sailing videos lately on YouTube Actually, I, I've kind of gotten into an addiction with this thing, so I probably need prayer. But uh, the, other night, the other night, as we were driving to church, and I said, Debbie, I think I missed my calling. I was supposed to own a sailboat and be a spearfisher. I'm pretty sure. She said, oh, dear. <laughs> Don't tell anybody that in church, please. Uh, too late. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm where I need to be. All right, so I'm also reading Hugh's, Hugh Ross's book, uh, The Improbable Planet, for the second time. Because every once in a while, I just like to overload my senses with the magnificence of God. I, I like to just magnify him as the Lord of the cosmos. Because I want to see him way bigger than that little neighborhood, you know, I live in and, and, and the little drive that I have. Hugh's book talks about the fine-tuning that went into Jesus' creation, and it is mind-boggling. I mean, most of it, I, don't, I can't even comprehend it, so over my head. But the earth is strategically placed in, in, a, in this incredibly unique spiral galaxy called the Milky Way with, with arms going out from the core. I mean, it, it's a unique galaxy, and we're in one of those arms. Uh, and, and, and we're placed just at the right distance from all the other galaxies so they won't tear ours apart like we see happening in other parts of the universe where they interact and end up destroying each other. We're, we're in one of those arms just the right distance from the core, which is a black hole and would destroy any chance of life if we were closer. We're also perfectly distanced from other stars, and our solar system is extremely unique in its composition. The number of elements and chemicals uh, that, that, that go into making this place habitable, it, it's impossible to grasp. I mean, there, there are numbers that are just so far out there. Back in 1966, astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were just two important factors for planets to be able to support life, the right kind of star and the right distance from the star. Well, that was totally debunked years ago. Scientists now say it's more like 800 different features that have to be perfectly fine-tuned and balanced. Without a, for instance, uh, would be without a massive planet like Jupiter nearby with the kind of gravity that draws away asteroids, a thousand times as many asteroids would hit the Earth's surface. So we, you know, we wouldn't be here. And we're at just the right time, at just the right angle in the universe to be able to see the whole creation story all the way back to the Big Bang. We're in this little window of time and space in perfectly positioned in the universe to be able to look back over the whole thing. If we were before or after or anywhere else, we wouldn't be able to see it. 
the impossibility of anything that we see around us existing as a result of random chance is like believing an explosion in a metal factory created a fine Swiss watch. You know, it's Jesus thought this stuff up. He designed it to declare the glory of who he is. The, 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 the intelligence in the design defies any, uh, any attempt to, to, to say that this was random. The Old Testament book of Job was written before the Bible. If you ever turn to it, you'll think it's the book of Job, but it's Job, and it was written before the Bible was written, and yet it is unbelievable how much these people knew about God simply by looking at nature and thinking what that reveals about the Creator. In America, you know, we live in caves. We hardly even get outside to see the sky, and even when we're driving, we've got a roof over our head. When we do look at the night sky, the stars generally are washed out by all the light we've created, and so we don't really see, you know, the, the, the grandeur and the, the, the amazing creation of God. Some of you probably won't get this reference. There was once a rock group called the Eagles, all right? They were kind of a big deal, and they wrote this hit song called Take It Easy. All right, let me, let me read you the first few lines. Well, I'm running down the road, trying to loosen my load. I've got seven women on my mind, four that want to own me, two that want to stone me. One says she's a friend of mine. Take it easy, take it easy. How many of you could sing the line? <laughs> sing it with me. Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. <laughs> See, I'm not the only old guy in the place. <laughs> That's amazing how many of you knew that line. I'll tell you, that stupid line won't leave me. I, I, that, is the, that thing stays in my head all the time. And you know why? Because I need it. Because the sound of my own wheels do drive me crazy. Unfortunately, that's you know, almost I ever hear is my mind you know, dragging up stuff. I want to be fascinated by the wonder and beauty of this man who is seated on the throne of heaven. I want to get my head out of the ditch, you know, out of my own. Uh, you know, I talk to God a lot about this in the shower. Lord, come on, help, you help your boy here. I got my head in the wrong direction. Help me get out of this. I want to see this man who created the star fields and all the majesty of this natural world that he made for my enjoyment. I want to get, get out, <laughs> you know, more than anything, just get outside, look around you for crying out loud. Jesus, number three, is radiance of God. Verse three describes him as the brightness of his glory. He's comparing his relationship to the Father with rays of light from the sun. I love the amplified version that says, he is the sole expression of the glory of God the light being the outraying or radiance of the divine. <laughs> Whoa, what does that mean? Think of, think of Jesus as the streaming forth of the Father's brilliance. Imagine a man who epitomizes the light that is emanating from the Father. In Revelation 21, 23, the apostle John sees the eternal city where we're gonna live with God forever, and he says, and the light and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's in the New Testament reference to Jesus. Can you imagine what that says about his brilliance? He literally lights up the eternal city. No wonder when John sees him after the resurrection, he falls in a dead faint at his feet. This is the guy who's hung out with Jesus for over three years. He's one of his closest friends, but he's totally undone when he sees Jesus morph into his true form as the outray of God's glory. He said, his eyes are like blazing fire and his face is like lightning. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I think God have fainted too. Right, or saying Jesus has the same nature and substance as God. He's got the same divine essence. Those are the words the early church fathers used and passed down to the ch through church history. And the Bible is also clear that even though Jesus is of the same essence, he's a distinct person. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God in three persons. We call him the Trinity. But the comparison is like 
the sun to its rays of light. Just like the radiance of the sun beams light and life to the earth, the radiance of Jesus beams light and life from the Father. The, the, the sun's rays express the same nature as the sun, being of the same substance, even though they're distinct. There's, there's no time in the sun's existence when those rays didn't exist. They're perfectly one. And as God, Jesus is both light and bearer or communicator of God's light. He's the outshining of the Father's light while he himself is the light. Did you get all that? <laughs> yeah, I've studied it all week and I, I'm not getting but about that much of it too. That was my best shot. But Paul does give us a personal application for it here in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He said, it is God the Father who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Now that's what we see him doing back in Genesis 1. The real miracle isn't the, that the light shines into the darkness, it's that the light shines out of the darkness. Did you notice that? And the same miracle happens with us. His light continues to shine out of our darkness. Paul's at the end of his life. It's, he's mystified by it. God once more shows him that it's through his human weakness that his divine strength shines the brightest. And Paul's going, this is blowing me away. It's amazing that God can be glorified through our humanity. That somebody as weak and broken as I am can even receive light, much less have light shine through me. That is the mystery and the miracle of the new creation. There's a whole verse. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or person of Jesus Christ. So this beaming of the Father touches us and awakens us through the power of the gospel. That's God's light in the face of Jesus Christ. And once we receive it, that light begins to shine through our darkness to touch others. Now, I don't fully get how this works, but I love the experience. Whoa. I mean, there is nothing like having God reveal Jesus through my weakness. Back in the 70s, early 70s, I discovered this, and I have been hooked ever since. Jesus said, you don't, put a, you don't light a candle and put it under a basket. You, you want to let your light shine. He's saying, look, guys, you don't have to have your act together to be a light. I mean, it's a good thing to get your act together at some point, but you don't have to have your act together to be, uh, for the light to shine through your darkness. I've, I've watched God use some of the most interesting people over the years. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I mean, people with all kinds of brokenness of their own who have led hundreds of others to Jesus. And I'm thinking, how does that work? Yeah, you know, I talk to people, and yeah, I, I've had this glorious encounter with the Lord, you know, and it's changed my whole life, changed my family, and it's, you know, so-and-so is the one who, and I'm thinking, S are you kidding me? How does that work? Because... It's, it's not us, the light's him. This is why I pray the use me prayer and the trust prayer list every day. God, shine your light through my weakness, reveal Jesus. It's uncanny how frequently that happens if I just keep asking for it and stay open. A few years back, Debbie and I stayed at, in a kind of Airbnb situation, it wasn't an Airbnb, but it, it was, uh, we took a trip to the Caribbean and a couple had, bought, had, had built a new home in this part of the Caribbean, and they rented part of it to travelers, and they rented us part for the week, and uh, somehow they found out early on that I was a pastor, and they asked me, in, in fact, they asked me up front if I would bless their home. Well, <laughs> with my church background, I didn't even know fully what that meant. I mean, talk about stretch me, but, but uh, you know, I said, well, sure. And so, you know, the whole trip, I'm sweating bullets. But, uh, it, I mean, it was, this was challenging for me. I'm thinking, what in the world? And, and she had holy water from the spring at Lourdes, France, that she wanted me to use to do the job. I'm thinking, oh, now I'm in deep. I don't know what this is about. I'm the holy water, oh my goodness. You know, and I'm sweating bullets. I'm, I'm thinking, this is gonna be different. I'm pretty sure a house has never been blessed the way this one was blessed. I'm 
telling you. <laughs> Literally to the moment it happened, I'm thinking, what in the world am I doing? What are you doing, Ron? You, don't, you need to tell them that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but you know what happened? I mean, we all ended up in tears. This was one of the most moving experiences. I kept hoping Debbie wasn't gonna laugh at me because I'm anointing doors and downspouts and I mean, I don't know what. I, I'm thinking, what part of the house do you anoint, you know? And, and then do you do crosses or do you just X's? I don't know. You know, if you weren't raised Catholic, you don't know these things. I mean, <laughs> there's nobody to teach you. So, so, so anyway, we finished this, and, and just to say the Lord used it as an understatement, I mean, it just was a real door to us being able to then pray for them. It just was, it just was a real cool experience. So uh, even though we don't speak the same language, you know, we had, a, we had fun trying, and she speaks enough English that, you know, we have tried to stay in touch over the year. Well, uh, we went back at, shortly after we were there, about a year later, her husband died. And, uh, and so we made a trip back and recently, this last month or so, she's getting ready to sell the house and we made one trip back. Well, this island is one that got devastated by Hurricane Irma. And, and I don't know, you know, those of us who are in the States, we didn't really hear about this. This, this thing had 200 mile an hour plus sustained winds, and they were right in the eye of it, and so this thing just went over uh, this island and decimated it. I mean, everybody on the island has a story of saying, you know, I, that was the night I thought I was gonna die, Cause, and so many did that are unaccounted for. I mean, it, it destroyed the island, just totally destroyed the island, and uh, so it, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, what was going through hers, was one of the only homes in this area that was not heavily damaged. I mean, it was just unbelievable. We're there, we're there, and all around, this is over a year later, all around, you know, whole awnings and roofs and everything else are off, everybody's getting repairs, and hers is, you know, just exactly the way we remember it. Even the, even the trees are still there. It's just, it's, it's insane. So she tells people, she, well, we, we had our home blessed. Now, don't ask me over to yours. You don't want this again. But, uh, but you know what it did? Our conversations to this day are mostly about God. And all to say that even in vacation mode, God will shine through your darkness, your weakness with his light if you'll just be open to it. Just say, Lord, use me. That's, that's that prayer we pray. We're commissioned to reflect the light of Jesus. It's how we make friends for eternity. There are a few people in heaven to say, I, you're the reason I'm here. And you are gonna want that with everything you have. Let's see how many of you remember this old commercial. Uh, there's a TV commercial, ran for years. And the guy said, I'm Tom Bodette from Motel 6. And we'll leave the light on for you. You know, I get emotional when I hear those words today because I think that's what God wants us to do. I think that's what this church is about. I mean, there's no question God's calling us to go deep in our relationship with him, but we always wanna leave the light on for people who are seeking truth, who are taking their first steps. We wanna be careful not to develop, I mean, we talk about this with our staff a lot, not to develop a code of religious jargon and lingo that only initiated people understand that's Christianese, you know, our little inside lingo, language, and, and we don't wanna be so free in our worship that we scare away first timers. Galatians 5, 13, Paul says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, only don't use your liberty as an opportunity to the flesh, but through love serve one another. He's, he's warning us, don't fog up the light with a lot of insider talk and personal religious add-ons. Keep it simple. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God that changes lives, period. That's, that's, what, that's what changed us. You know, there are a lot of cool other things, but that's the bottom line. You know, stay committed to that. And a phrase that's helped us immensely around here over the years is there are people in every one of our lives who are what? 
one ask away from a life-changing encounter with God's son. Our church is populated with people who can tell you, yeah, I'm one of those ask. I'm walking out and one of the ushers back there said, yeah, I'm, an, I'm a one ask away person. I, I came because somebody invited me. Changed his whole life. Met his wife here. I mean, everything changed. Somebody invited him to a service. As the world gets darker, people are looking for hope. I mean, this is the perfect time to be letting your lights shine, letting Jesus shine through you. This is a major, major opportunity. A window is about to hit us. You all got uh, you know, invites a couple weeks ago uh, to our church Christmas Eve services. We got way more of them out there on the tables. Invite somebody this, this week. Doesn't get any easier than this. This is a time of year when people are totally open to an invite to, to a big special event. And this is going to be special, guys. This is going to be a classical, one of, one of our best. I, I'm telling you, one of our best services are those two that happen on Monday of what? A week? Is it a week away? No, no, no. It's two weeks away, right? Whew, I was sweating. Every time Debbie and I attend a, a new member's dinner, we meet families who are here in this church because of a Christmas event. Somebody invited them. That was the first time they came. People will thank you for inviting them to this. I guarantee you. So don't miss that opportunity. We're going to have to figure out how to get the crowd split up because uh, we don't want to happen what happened at, at Drummer Boy ever again. <laughs> All right, but we'll figure it out. All right. Number four, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Verse three says, Jesus is the express image of the Father's person. Other versions say he's the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature. The Son perfectly mirrors God. He's the Father's substance, essence, and deity. God, God's glory is literally shining through the resurrected human body of Jesus Christ. And what makes that staggering is 1 Timothy 6.16 says, God the Father dwells in unapproachable light, meaning nobody can see him and live. But John, uh, uh, in John 14.9, Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the visible expression of this God who dwells in unapproachable light. And until he came along, we didn't have an accurate picture of God. The perception in the Old Testament is, you know, he's kind of fearful. You, you know, he's a God of wrath. But it's because of the effect on, of sin on humanity. We talked a little about it last week when God tried to have a family chat with, his, with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. He was, to them, he was all fire, smoke, lightning, and terrifying noise. They begged him to talk to Moses. Sin clouds our perception so that we can't see God's love and mercy and justice. He just appears as this mist of unapproachable light which really explains something C.S. Lewis once said. He, this is about the people who end up in hell. He said, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. I mean, the presence of God is painful when we're living in sin. That's why Adam and Eve suddenly felt naked and tried to hide from God. Nobody had to teach them to feel guilty. Guilt is the emotional pain of sin. It's why heaven would be hell to an unrepentant sinner. God's holiness hurts us until we experience the miracle of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Jesus solves our sin problem by making, his, making us righteous with his own righteousness. So suddenly, heaven is habitable for us. Hebrews 4.16 says, now we can approach God's throne, the very throne of God's grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's available to every one of us right now through Jesus Christ. We can have the boldness and confidence of a little child where we uh, can come before God with confidence and say, Abba, Daddy. Number five, he's the sustainer of the universe. Verse three in the Amplified says Jesus is upholding, maintaining, guiding, and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. That's why our planet doesn't go spinning out of orbit. Jesus is still speaking into the laws of physics and gravity. He's maintaining and guiding his church. That's why we're still around after so many serious attempts to obliterate us over the century. On a personal level, he keeps my heart beating, my lungs breathing, my body repairing itself and reproducing cells and a multitude of other things that we're just starting to learn about. 
By the word of his power, he energizes, renews everything he creates. He sustains it with the word of his power or it would wear out. Scientists call that entropy. It's the universal law that's built into the very fabric and physics of our universe. God designed it that way because, maybe you didn't know this, this world is not our final home. The, re, the creation we see was designed to wear out. It was made to prepare us for our forever home. God wanted the, to first deal with the problem of evil and birth a family who wanted to be with him forever. And that could take a whole sermon to just talk about, unpack. But that's an that's a incredible idea. The Bible says, in the end, the cosmos will melt with a fervent heat and be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth. Now, he Ross says entropy won't exist in that realm because there'll be new physics. <laughs> I'm totally out of my depth on that one. And don't ask me to explain anything about that. I don't know how that all works, but I know we'll like it. It'll be awesome. Number six, Jesus is the redeemer of the universe. Only a perfect man could cleanse the earth. And now I'm just gonna keep going over this. because I, I want us all to be able to explain this. Back in Genesis 1, God gave leadership and management of the earth to Adam and his descendants. Adam handed it over to the devil when he sinned. And from that point on, there were no perfect humans until God became a human. By becoming a man and not sinning, the Son of God could rightfully take back the title deed of the earth. He became the last Adam and gave the entire human race a fresh start. Look at how Paul says that, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first man, Adam, became a living being, an individual personality. The last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit, restoring the dead to life. Now, of all Jesus' creative efforts, this was the most difficult. He only had to speak for the world to come into existence. He only has to speak to sustain it. But eradicating sin, that's a whole other deal. He had to take on the form of a man, be earthbound, live a perfect human life as one of us in every way to be able to qualify as our substitute. If he had sinned, it would have been that he would have died for himself. He had, to be, he, had to, he had to be perfect, he had to be flawless, and then he had to be crushed and bear the full penalty of God's wrath as the final payment for our sin. That's way more than creating and sustaining life. And here's the other dilemma. Once Jesus became a man, it's a forever deal. But it's what he wanted, it was his choice. In John 20, verse 17, right after his resurrection, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and she is overwhelmed. She is hugging him and grabbing him, and he said, no, no, don't hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead, look at this, the excitement in his, I can see the excitement in him. Go instead to my brothers, and tell them I'm ascending to my Father, and get this, your Father to my God and your God. He's excited, he's calling them family. This is the first time he's addressed them since he once and for all has solved the sin problem and now he's calling them brothers and he's saying, this God that you've only known is unapproachable light, it, he's your daddy. I'm going to him and you're coming with me. He didn't get us, you know, he didn't get us there the way he created and sustains and rules the universe. He embraced our humanity, he suffered our shame and punishment with a humility we can't even comprehend. We're gonna talk about that next weekend. He sacrificed himself. Jesus is the one and only redeemer of the universe. It's why he can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the only door to heaven. And we made it to seven, can you believe it? I, I'm having a hard time believing it. All right, we made it. Here, he's also the ruler of the universe. That's the last part of that verse, the amplified version of uh, verse three says, when he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. What's remarkable isn't the fact that God's son is seated at his right hand. I mean, that's as it should be. What's remarkable is the fact there's a man on the throne of heaven. Jesus rose from the dead and after Mary lets go of him, he ascends and is greeted with a huge coronation event that happened on the first Easter. He's crowned in a massive event that'll one day be repeated on the earth. Every eye of every demon angel, fallen angel, believer and unbeliever alike will see Jesus crowned as Lord of all and every knee will bow, whether they want to or not. 
That's gonna be an amazing event. This is the man we love and serve and obey and the reason we get up early to praise, the reason we fast and give and study the Bible. We want the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus, to fascinate us with his beauty and overwhelm us with his glory and majesty. We wanna be drawn into his humility. I, I want all the coldness and dullness and indifference in my heart to melt till I'm loving him with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength till knowing him and loving him and seeing him is my one thing. And I'm finding that's a process. It's not, a one, it, it's not you know, something that just happens overnight. It's the more I seek him, the more I want, the more I'm finding, the more it's happening. Well, the fact that he sent out the right hand of the Father means the Father received him. His sacrifice was accepted, and our salvation is secure, and my sins are forgiven. God has received a man as his eternal partner. Whew, guys, what a, what a statement. God has received a man as his eternal partner, and through baptism in Christ, that now becomes my position. What Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You wanna know why you need to go to the tank and get baptized today after church? There it is right there. You're identifying Christ with, with him in death, burial, and resurrection. Daniel and Ezekiel are Old Testament prophets. They lived 500 years before Jesus is born. I mean, it's longer than we've been a nation. And both of these guys have a vision of a man seated on the throne of heaven. It's hard to imagine what a massive deal it, that, that is 2,500 years ago. That was unthinkable, especially in the minds of a Jew. You know, In Ezekiel 126, the young prophet said he saw what looked like a throne, this gorgeous thing made of lapis lazuli, this expensive uh, uh, stone and beautiful stone. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And Ezekiel's going, huh, I, I, that's, that can't be right. He's sitting next to God. That's impossible. A man on the throne of heaven? What does this mean? And his contemporary, Daniel, sees something similar. A little more explanation, Daniel 7, 13. He says, I was watching in the night vision. I'm wide awake, and behold, one like the Son of Man came to the Ancient of Days, came to God the Father, and then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. What? His dominion's an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel sees, sees the same thing, what appears to be a man sitting next to God, and he's thinking, how can a man approach God and live, much less rule over all and be to told that his dominion will never end? Can you imagine how confusing that must have been? That was his prophetic message, and he died without ever fully understanding what in the world that meant. But this, is, this is, was the monumental breakthrough. A man got to the pinnacle of power. There is nothing higher in the created order. A man got there, and he calls out to us, come join me. Come reign with me. That's what Jesus is calling us to. He's at the pinnacle of power. Listen to how he prays. John 17, 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. He receives ultimate power and says, Father, I'm doing this so they can be next to me forever. It's the greatest breakthrough of all time. A man now sits on the throne of heaven and invites us to come be with him and reign with him. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did for us. I want us to get this. You are Jesus' inheritance. You are Jesus. He endured the cross for the joy of being with you forever. That's how much you mean to him. You, have, you, you mean everything to him. But you have to receive his gift of forgiveness in eternal life. John 1:11 says, he came to his own, but his own people did not receive him. Look at this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know what that means? You're just, this is your decision. This is not a decision your parents made for you. This is not about what church you were baptized in as an infant. This receiving is something only you can do. If you have never accepted Jesus' gift of forgiveness and eternal life, you can do it right now. 
You can do it right here. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. This is your moment. The Holy Spirit is shining light on who Jesus is. That's what you're feeling right now. That's why this is making sense right now. That's why you can think clearly right now about this. It, it, you're, you're not promised endless invites. There's an urgency to this. You have to act when God is prompting. Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father draws, me, draws him. He's drawing you right now. That's what you're feeling. That's what's happening. It's time to act on it. This is the gospel, here it is. The sinless son of God became a human being, lived a perfect life on the cross. He laid it down as the perfect sacrifice. God turned his back on his only son and judged our sins in his sinless body. Paul says he was nailing our sins to Christ's cross. So that when Jesus comes out of that tomb, as the firstborn from the dead, he now has the power to forgive us and make us right with the holy God. He can be perfectly just and fair in making sinners like us righteous with his own righteousness because of his sacrifice. Amen. That's why the apostle Peter says in Acts 4, 12, there is salvation in no one else. God has given us no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There is no other way, there is no other religion, there is no other door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the one and only, there's no one like him. He is the universal savior. And if you're getting this, it means Jesus, the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to see Jesus. I mean, you have no idea how precious this is. Respond to it. It really is this simple. Receive the love he's offering you. Let him forgive your sin. Let him give you the gift of eternal life. Let's bow our heads together. If you're ready to do that, I'm ready to lead you in a prayer of invitation. But I, I, I wanna know. I just, I feel, man, I'm so convinced the Holy Spirit is in this place right now. And this is your moment. This is your moment, this is your moment, this will be the day that you remember the rest of your eternal life if you'll respond to this. How many of you say, I'm getting it, I want, the, I want in, I want this. Just raise your hand, I'm, not, I'm just gonna pray for you, nobody else is looking around. Just raise your hand right now, I see your hands going up, all over, all over. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. What is about to happen in this place? Oh my goodness, a miracle that's about to take place here. Thank you, Jesus. All right, everybody just stand with me. Whew, my goodness, God. You, you, know, you know why you're responding? God's doing something in you. You're, you're not gonna be the same when you leave here. See, can it be this simple? It really is this simple. He's opened your eyes, so now all you have to do is receive it. So here's the prayer, all right? Let's just close our eyes together. Just, just say this with me. God, I believe what the Bible says about Jesus. I believe that he is your son, that he became human, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died in my place to remove all my sins, God, you nail my sins to his cross so that you could give me the gift of eternal life. Acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my brokenness to you. I repent. I receive your love and forgiveness. And I invite you to come and live in me and I commit to follow you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, something supernatural just happened in your spirit. Jesus called it being born again. And so, prayer team, come on down here. I want y'all to hurry up. Let's get this sealed and done here this morning. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to come down and let these people just touch you and pray for you. Seal what has started here, what had just woke up your spirit, just came alive to God. 
God is alive in you now. Your sins are forgiven. Come let somebody pray for you before you, before you walk out of here today, all right? If you, have, if you just prayed that prayer, you just talked to the Lord for the first time in this way and accepted the gospel, you just heard the gospel, the power of God to save your soul, and that's just what happened. So if you prayed that prayer, come down right now while we're, while we're, gonna, we're gonna sing one more song, all right? While we're doing that, you come down and let them pray for you. And also, if you have any other need in your life, you have an area of, you know, you want healing or anything else, this is the opportunity for that as well. Oh, Lord, we're just so grateful, so grateful for what you're doing in our hearts, what you're doing in lives right now. Touch us now by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name.